Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel on best practices for building database as a service on cloud native storage. That was a long name for the panel. My name is Deepti Sigredi. I'm a software engineer at PlanetScale, where we are building a database as a service on Kubernetes. I'm also a contributor and a maintainer of the Vitus open source CNCF project. Uh, we'll let the panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll get on with the discussion. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, in Percona, uh, I am in charge of developing solutions for Kubernetes and uh, clouds. Particularly, I am working on a Kubernetes operator for uh, MySQL and for MongoDB. Percona is database vendor. We have quite wide expertise in open source databases. And uh, uh, we have own fork of uh, MySQL, of MongoDB, and we have developed some storages for Postgres. I'm Makola. Hi, my name is uh, Michael. I'm a DevOps architect at Soprasteria. And my job in Soprasteria is to help the, the different teams to, to port their solution to Kubernetes and to OpenShift mainly. So uh, I had very quickly to, to face the problem of the container storage. OK. Uh, hi, my name is Adrian. I'm working for a company called Creative. We offer support and, uh, of course, services and consultancy for open source software, uh, not especially for Kubernetes, but also for uh, PostgreSQL, Ceph, GlassDFS, and so on. Uh, my personal work is mostly related uh, to PostgreSQL. So um, my job is to help our customers to get rid of problems they already have, they might be facing in the future, or simply answer questions they have in production. Also, I'm a Debian maintainer, and um, if you are currently using uh, PostgreSQL on Debian, you might or might not have heard of us. The first question for our panel is, why do we want to run databases on Kubernetes? And we'll have Michael go first. So, so, so the question is, why should we run databases on Kubernetes? Uh, I'm going to answer from the point of the CI-CD process. When you, when you make CI-CD, you often have to, to pop up a complete stack of your application. You need your front-end application, your middleware application, and of course, your databases. And uh, for this, Kubernetes is great, because Kubernetes is really great when you need to, to build some very good CI-CD process. But uh, when, when it comes to, to pop up a complete new stack, one thing that you need to pop up as well is the databases. So uh, it's part of the process to recreate everything from scratch, including the databases. If you don't include the databases in this, what is going to happen is you have a very, like, a, a not working CI CD process because you pop up everything except the databases, the databases. And that's not going to work in the long term. You need to pop up everything the application front end, the middleware front end, and the databases. So that's one of the first reasons we, uh, we, we meet when we needed to. to, to to build databases in Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, so imagine a developer would like to test a future a feature branch, and uh, he forks off the branch, push it up to uh, GitLab, whatever, and uh, your CI/CD pipeline uh, begins to run, and uh, you deploy everything, you deploy load balancer, you deploy your new um, application version, but what about the database? So uh, you need a way to uh, set up the database, and to be honest, um, you would like to have a database cluster instead of a database, depending on your requirements. Um, and you need, uh, of course, to bootstrap this database. And by bootstrapping, I mean, um, 
you need at least a schema if the application isn't responsible to set up this, to set this up uh, and of course you might need some kind of data to play around with and run your application tests, run performance tests, and so on. And Kubernetes is a great way to, uh, to make this automation happen if you already use Kubernetes to deploy your application, your load balance, and, and so on. Another uh, reason why we would like to run databases in Kubernetes, in my opinion, is uh, to prevent the use of uh, some proprietary uh, databases. And by pro pro proprietary databases, I not only mean the uh, big red one or uh, whatever, um, I also mean uh, database as a service providers like uh, RDS on, uh, on Azure and so on. So, um, if you don't run, run your database on Kubernetes or run it yourself on some kind of VMs, the obvious um, alternative is to use some kind of database as a service which is already provided at your cloud provider, um, which works fine if you don't have a problem. And uh, if you use the database in a sense that the cloud provider think you might use it, but if you use, uh, used to have some sort of extension or version of an extension for a database which isn't supported by a cloud provider, you are very unlucky. And uh, you have no chance to come, um, get around with these issues. Another thing might be bug fixes. So imagine a situation where, uh, from my opinion, a PostgreSQL minor updates comes in, and uh, you hit that bug that uh, leads to planning issues with your special query, which formerly runs in 200 milliseconds and now runs in three seconds. Depending on the use case you have, uh, this might be a real issue for you. Imagine a user which uh, tries to save something in a web interface. If he has to wait 200 milliseconds, that's OK. If he has to wait two seconds every time he um, hits the Save button, that might be a problem. And um, if you run into that bug, um, you have to wait for the cloud provider uh, to get the latest minor update available. If you're running your database in Kubernetes, you are able to fix it yourself if it really hurts you. And um, that's one of the reasons. Um, one third reason, it doesn't depend if you run on-premise, in Google, in Azure, or whatever cloud provider. You put up your database on Kubernetes, and what is your underlying platform doesn't matter to you anymore. What are the biggest challenges with running a database in Kubernetes? Mikola? So uh, the biggest challenge, uh, I, technically, I believe it is ephemeral nature of Kubernetes. So uh, before Kubernetes, we uh, installed databases on uh, super reliable hardware and think that accident never going to happen. But it will. In Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes itself built around this everything ephemeral idea. Uh, and uh, it is only a question how often you're going to have failover of your database in Kubernetes. So uh, I think that uh, only right database architecture uh, allow us to avoid uh, downtime of your database in Kubernetes. But uh, yes, I, I believe it is time for database uh, vendors uh, to uh, embed all own expertise about high availability and uh, uh, reliability into own Kubernetes operators. And uh, only these operators uh, can allow us to uh, build uh, and have uh, enough level of reliability. 
Adrian? Um, operators are a very nice thing, um, especially if you're not a database guy, uh, which <laughs> actually knows which, uh, how everything works underneath. Um, so you're right. Um, but uh, one of the main problems I'm currently facing is uh, more or less the, the change of roles and the change of uh, responsibilities. Um, imagine in, in the old times uh, you have to uh, you have to open up a ticket to get a new database server, database cluster, whatever. Um, now you're just deploying your database yourself, and um, there is a certain change of responsibilities. So as an as a traditional DBA. You, you don't know which databases are currently running on your cluster, right? And um, so because the users provide the clusters by themselves, you just have to offer blueprints uh, to make sure they did it in the right way. So you have um, set up a whole replication cluster, so you might um, be able to fail over if a node gets drained or something like that. You need to make sure you have monitoring. You need to make sure you have uh, backup and uh, recovery plans, uh, disaster recovery plans, and so on. And uh, in my opinion, where our traditional uh, DBA formerly uh, are, was responsible to set up those database clusters, he is now responsible to make sure all the the needed blueprints are available, and the right uh, operator configs and so on are in place. So users, which are not really into databases, um, can provide it themselves and, yeah, don't think about every detail if stream replication lags, TCP IP uh, timings, and so on. What are the trade-offs when choosing storage for your database in Kubernetes? So uh, to, to answer this challenging question, um, I'm going to, to give an example of, of a bench I did. Uh, I don't know if any of you know the, the bench tool for Postgres SQL. It's PG, PG bench, PG bench. And uh, here is what I did. I use um, a free kind of storage, uh, a cluster FS storage, a cluster block storage, and a native storage, which is a regular file system on the computer. And I run the PG bench on this because I wanted to see what's the impact of using a S SDS like a cluster on the performance of the database. And strangely, when you skim the internet, you notice that there is no real study about that. You can't find information of how is the use of my SDS is going to impact the perf my performance database. You can't find anything on that. That's really strange. So I decided to, to run my own. And what I saw was that when you are doing a very intensive write operation, SDS are really bad. It's something like, uh, for the cluster file system, it's something like uh, 40 times less efficient than a native storage. And when it's cluster block, it's something like 10 times less efficient. So I would say that if you are using a SDS storage like Gluster, like Safe, and you, you're doing very intensive write operation all the time, and you have some speed requirements, don't use such a system. Instead, go to something like local volume or maybe a database somewhere else. But if you are not doing very intensive write operation all the time, and you are just doing read, or mainly read operation, then uh, I didn't notice a very big difference between SDS and native storage. Why? I think mainly because the, the database have a very good cache system. And when you are doing read, the first time it could be a bit slow, but the next time is going to be very quick. So uh, that was my experience 
from the storage container uh, for the database. What are the performance implications of using Kubernetes to run database as a service? Uh, so, uh, basically, a uh, question about performance of databases in Kubernetes environment. And uh, we can uh, uh, expect uh, some performance issues in four areas. It is CPU, memory, it is storage, and uh, network. And uh, if uh, with CPU and memory it is more or less uh, simple, uh, just Kubernetes use Docker, Docker use uh, control groups, C groups, and uh, C groups has own uh, performance limitations. Uh, it is because kernel sh should uh, be able to calculate how many resources you use, so uh, it has some performance degradation. But it is not so big, and we have a hope to the C groups version too. Uh, but uh, with storage, it is uh, yeah. If it is cloud, uh, storage is simple. You can use. Elastic block storage, Azure block storage, or something, and uh, they are pretty good. They have enough uh, good uh, performance for running databases in Kubernetes. But on premise, on premise, you need to buy some solution, <laughs> and uh, it can cost for you. <coughs> uh, but if your database uh, or Kubernetes operator for your database has right design. Uh, architecture, in that case, you can uh, try to use local storage. And uh, uh, local storage is uh, pretty, has pretty good uh, enough uh, performance, and you can use it, and that's great in some databases, in some architectures. Uh, but networking is not so simple. Uh, networking, uh, I believe uh, networking right now, it is the biggest stopper of moving big databases to the Kubernetes. Uh, just uh, imagine situations that you have database with few terabytes and have three replicas of your database in Kubernetes. What if uh, it will need it to get full state transfer from one pod to another pod in your Kubernetes network of few terabytes? That's uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, in Percona, in our tests, we see uh, from 30% till two times slower performance of databases in Kubernetes comparing to running uh, the same database on the same hardware uh, on, uh, directly on operation system. Given everything we have heard today, do you recommend running a production database on Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, honestly, you need to get uh, yes on too many ifs to run your production database in Kubernetes. Uh, for example, if you have enough expertise in Kubernetes, that's important, uh, yeah? If your database has right design, right architecture, uh, if you know what is going to happen in case of failover and you tested all possible failover scenarios with your database, if you have small database because of network, and uh, maybe, at least maybe, uh, you need uh, to have some database vendor who signed your SLA. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with uh, with Mikula. So uh, there are my answer to your specific question is it depends. It depends on uh, many factors. So it depends on um, what are your requirements are, what are your expectations, what is the environment looking like you're running on. And, uh, of course, you always say that, uh, knowledge. So, uh, for example, uh, if this is my first Kubernetes cluster and I didn't run anything on Kubernetes before, it might be not the best idea to start with the databases. Um, 
And of course, you need to know, uh, or at least one team in your organization need to know how databases work um, in depth. So you, you need to make sure when something happens, there's always some person you, uh, person you can talk to. Uh, it might be the person on the, in the next office or some, yeah, uh, some partner which provides uh, mm, affordable uh, SLA. Another thing where I wouldn't put my database on Kubernetes uh, are databases that squeeze out the last bit of performance um, from the underlying hardware. So we have a lot of customers where we need to tune the I.O. scheduler, the uh, underlying uh, disk layout, uh, where we have uh, to s some kernel tuning parameters or I.O. scheduler uh, settings to be adjusted so the database can uh, get the most out of the hardware that is used to run those databases. If you are running such a database, migration would be really hard, not because of the, um, the limitations that uh, Mukula already, uh, already showed, um, but because it's very difficult to uh, adjust all those settings in a Kubernetes like, uh, in an environment like Kubernetes. And if you uh, don't hit one of those limitations uh, and you say, okay, let's try to run our databases in Kubernetes, why not? Um, make sure you have all required components in place. So uh, I said it before, but I'll repeat it because it's very important. Need, make sure you have your backup plans, uh, test recovery. Uh, I don't know uh, which of the speakers said it before, but automate your recovery and test your recovery procedures. I remember that, uh, that one call from a customer who said, oh, our database crashed. Um, our first question was, uh, do you have backups? Um, and the answer was, yeah, we are supposed to have three, but backup solution one didn't work, backup solution two was broken since two months, nobody noticed it, and backup solution three was already not working. So uh, when testing your recovery procedures in an automated way, you have, you're most likely to have a better sleep. The other thing is uh, monitoring. So um, if you put up a cluster con consisting of uh, three replicas, um, how do you make sure all those replicas get the latest changes or are up to date, depending on how, you, uh, how you're replicating, uh, if you're running synchronously or asynchronously? Make sure all the right headlocks are uh, in place and uh, make sure you're able to do point-in-time recovery and so on. I drive my, in my private environment, I run databases, production databases for many years now and didn't have any problem, but there are some corner cases where you might not afford a data loss. So in these situations, you always have to test everything, test every failure scenario, uh, measure the impact of failovers, rebuilding, full-state transfer, what's the word you, you used yeah. before. Um, yeah, that's my opinion. Incidentally, on Wednesday, I'll be giving a talk on Vitus with uh, the city of Planet Scale, Sugu Sugumaran, where we will talk about how to run uh, production databases in Kubernetes. Shameless plug ends here. <laughs> we do have time for questions, don't we? Okay. Any questions? Nobody wants to run his database <laughs> on Kubernetes. I guess since there are no questions, I just want to thank our panelists. For, oh, oh, we don't have a question. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. 
I'd like to ask about PostgreSQL database and potential use in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so recently I've uh, run into a Patroni uh, Uh, to run a backup in the solution. So uh, it depends on the kind of backup you are trying to, to do. So uh, if you are doing logical backups or physical backups, uh, if you're uh, running uh, logical backups, start a Kubernetes cron job which connects to the database, pulls out the data, and you're done. If you're um, trying to do um, physical backups, you could use the same approach and uh, don't use pgdump to dump the database, but uh, use um, pgbase backup, which uh, pulls out a full database copy of your database service and uh, write it to disk. Things get more complicated if you uh, want to use point-in-time recovery, because for point-in-time recovery, you need uh, regular base backups and you need uh, write a headlock archiving. Um, and there are many approaches to, to achieve the same result. But uh, in the end, you have to make sure uh, you have some kind of repository where uh, all your base backups and all your write headlocks are um, backed up. Um, I could recommend, uh, have a look into tools like uh, PG Backrest, Wally, uh, and something like that. What, what it said? It's, uh, it's a concussion included Wally. Wally, yeah. Uh, but how about if I, if I try to approach it uh, by assumption, native cloud native stuff? Actually, we are out of time, so you're welcome to continue the discussion we, we afterwards, after. offline. I'd like to now thank our panelists, Mikola, Michael, and Adrian, for talking to us today on this topic that I'm sure is of interest to a lot of people. And thank you all for attending.